show your support. Like, share and subscribe. Hello, I am that British guy and welcome to the Raw After. Now, instead of looking at historic pay-per-views, I have decided to look at, as the name suggests, the Raw After, those pay-per-views. Now, I know historically March is the month for WrestleMania, but this year and the last few years, WrestleMania has been contested in April. So it will be in April that I look at the Raw after a WrestleMania, specifically WrestleMania 9. So in this video, I will be looking at the Raw after Fastlane 2017, as this is one of the few pay-per-views in the month of March that isn't a WrestleMania. So Fastlane 2017, just to get you up to speed, that was the pay-per-view where Bailey beat Charlotte to retain the Raw Women's Championship and thus ended Charlotte's pay-per-view streak. And much more notably, it was the pay-per-view where Jericho returned after a few weeks off after the Festival of Friendship segment and he ended up costing Kevin Owens the Universal title against Goldberg in the main event. So, what happened the Raw after Fastlane 2017? Let's find out right now. So, right at the beginning of the episode, we get a recap of the main event from Fastlane, showing Jericho returning and distracting Kevin Owens, so that he walks into a spear and a jackhammer and loses the Universal title in about 30 seconds. Then, Jericho himself comes out, and he is currently the United States Champion, and and he basically congratulates Goldberg on his win, which is a little odd given their history, but there you go. And he explains why he did what he did, the fact that he was best friends with Kevin Owens for months and helped him to keep hold of his title all that time and then got stabbed in the back at the Festival of Friendship and so he decided to make Kevin Owens feel that kind of betrayal. At this point Owens himself then comes out and basically says to Jericho I didn't stab my best friend in the back as you seem to believe because you were never my best friend. Sami Zayn was my best friend once and look what I did to him. I've beaten him so many times and I would do it again and again and again for success in a heartbeat. He said the reason that he turned his back on Jericho is Triple H made it very clear to him the night he won the Universal title, you are going to have a massive target on you now so you need to make sure that you do anything you can to keep hold of that belt. So that is why he ends up sort of recruiting Jericho, a man who he explains has done that kind of thing before and would do that sort of thing himself to keep hold of his belt. And the minute Jericho agreed to the title match against Goldberg on Owens' behalf was the immediate moment that Jericho outstayed his welcome. He was no longer useful to Owens and that is why he turned on him at the Festival of Friendship. And this is where things get a little bit odd. Rather than refocusing his efforts on the Universal title, as logic would dictate, obviously Goldberg had to go into that marquee match with Brock Lesnar and they wanted it for the main title, just to kind of hype it up as much as they could to make it mean as much as possible. Owens basically says to Jericho, you cost me my title, therefore I'm going to make you feel that as well, I'm going to cost you your title, you and me, at Wrestlemania for the United States title. Jericho immediately agrees, and something else that Owen says in this segment, which is quite interesting, is that he will get his title back when the time is right, because he has his rematch clause, and he will invoke that whenever the time is right which obviously he was never able to do because he got drafted straight over to SmackDown and for some reason they didn't give him a WWE opportunity even though he kind of deserved one. But that's another problem for another time. Samoa Joe then comes down and jumps Jericho. 
Sami Zayn comes down as well to try and even the odds and we get a match straight away after Kevin Owens versus Sami Zayn for the four billionth time. Now these two are pretty good in the ring together obviously they know each other's offense and how to work a match with each other really really well. Zayn all fired up dominates Kevin Owens for most of the match. It's just a shame really that at this point they had been in the ring against each other so many times that the crowd had kind of just gone numb to it. They've done everything they could possibly do to each other throughout NXT and then when they came up to the main roster that feud basically carried on and I mean it was said the previous year that the match between them at Battleground was going to be the end of their feud and here they are nine months after the fact and they're still facing each other. Anyway, Zayn is on top for most of the match as I said until he receives a pop-up powerbomb and instead of trying for the pin, Owens picks Zayn up again as punishment and delivers a second pop-up powerbomb to him before pinning him 1-2-3. Right. Next up we have a cruiserweight title match. Now Neville had defended his title the previous night at Fastlane against Jack Gallagher and here he is 24 hours later defending it against Rich Swan, who he'd beaten for the title at Royal Rumble pay-per-view. However, most of the focus in this match was placed upon Austin Aries. Obviously those two would go into WrestleMania 33 feuding for the title and then for the months following Wrestlemania 33 and this was basically used um, as the starting point of Neville and Austin Aries' feud. Now the match itself was okay, the problem was by this point the crowd had already gone cold on the Cruiserweight division and 205 Live. Thankfully it's come a hell of a way in the 12 months since. Neville was on top for the majority of the match. Rich Swan does get a few hope spots in here and there and a few big moves to try and pop the crowd but pretty much straight away Neville gets back on top of him. In one last ditch attempt towards the end, Rich Swan tries to hit a Phoenix Splash onto Neville because nothing else has been able to put him away, but Neville manages to dodge the Splash and immediately hooks Rich Swan into the Rings of Saturn, making him tap out so that Neville successfully defends his Cruiserweight title for a second match in 24 hours. Then after the match, Austin Aries gets into the ring to interview Neville and the crowd are mad for this. Austin Aries received an injury around his eye just as he was leaving NXT and it kind of delayed his debut on the main roster so they kept trying to keep him in a commentary role for cruiserweight matches just to keep him in the crowd's mind and keep him on TV and he's interviewing Neville basically congratulating him on his wins um, but sort of undermining him as a champion sort of saying that he hasn't really come up against any decent challenges yet which is a great way of burying half a division and Neville sort of squares up to him and says look there's no one on my level I am the king of the cruiserweights no one is taking this from me and Ares is sort of giving as good as he gets, convinced that he is on Neville's level and delivers the five arm, laying him out and sending Neville out to the back with his tail between his legs. Next up there is a backstage segment between The Bar and Enzo and Cass. Now The Bar have just recently lost their titles to the club and Enzo and Cass faced the club at Fastlane for the titles and were unsuccessful. And they're basically talking each other down, calling each other losers and this will play into how things pan out for both teams later on. Next up we have the Universal Champion himself Goldberg coming out to plenty of pyro Quite nice to see that back, even only a year ago. I kind of miss it, to be honest. And he thanks the crowd for getting behind him against Kevin Owens. There is then a really random CM Punk chant, which is as annoying then as it still is now. And this is when he is interrupted by Paul Heyman, 
who leads out Brock Lesnar. He comes out and he says, well done to you Goldberg. I am not man enough to shake your hand, but here is a man who is. And this is when Brock Lesnar comes out and they are sort of face to face with each other in the ring. Goldberg doesn't say anything else then for the rest of the promo. Heyman just takes over entirely. And after hyping up their match and sort of saying that, yeah, you may have had Brock Lesnar's number recently, but we'll see who is standing tall at WrestleMania. But for now, let's end it on a handshake. Brock and Goldberg go to handshake, but Brock picks Goldberg up and delivers an F5 to him, laying him out. And at this point, Paul Heyman is screaming at Goldberg, calling him Lesnar's bitch. This, interestingly, is the first upper hand that Brock Lesnar has over Goldberg at any point since Goldberg comes back. Obviously, we have the Survivor Series match. And their interaction in the Royal Rumble, Goldberg was all over Lesnar in those segments and obviously won their now infamous match at WrestleMania 20 because Goldberg does make quite a few 2-0 references towards Lesnar. Then we get a recap of the tensions between Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns leading into their match at Fastlane and how they threw absolutely everything at each other but Roman Reigns was just able to overcome Braun Strowman and leave victorious. Then we have a tag team title match between the club and Enzo and Cass and it's quite odd that they're getting another title match 24 hours after losing the last one but there we are and at the the very start of the match they just show the end of the fast lane match where Enzo has his foot on the rope but Gallows seeing that the referee hasn't noticed it yet knocks his foot off of the rope presumably they use that to allow Enzo and Cass to have another shot at the titles but it's not really explained very well to be honest it's kind of glossed over you kind of have to infer that information yourself Cass is all over the champs at the very beginning of the match for about five minutes or so, just absolutely dominating them. Enzo sort of comes in, doesn't really do much, and, and Cass then comes back in and carries on the domination. The bar then come to ringside, and they don't get directly involved in the match, they're just sort of standing, watching, just making Enzo and Cass aware of the fact that they're there. It's at this point that this sort of mild distraction sort of helps the club out and they are able to dominate against Cass, which is really weird seeing the bigger man playing the baby face in peril so that then when he gets the hot tag, the smaller Enzo comes in. But I suppose he's quite explosive and quick and it does play into how the match goes forward. Basically, the club do end up dominating on Cass until the hot tag. Enzo comes in like a whirlwind and part of his offence he dives over the top rope and takes out Luke Gallows and while he's sort of celebrating that with the crowd and going a bit crazy he's not looking where he's going and basically knocks Cesaro's coffee all over him. Scarpers into the ring and Cesaro follows him in and the whole thing then ends up in a disqualification and a victory for the club. Way to make them look strong. That's two title victories that they've won. One by kind of shenanigans, but kind of clever I suppose, but it's still not a clean victory. And then a DQ victory against Enzo and Cass. Great. No wonder they're still not taken seriously as a tag team. Anyway, Cesaro and Sheamus then come into the ring and lay everyone out and end up standing tall. So at least it sort of pushes them back into the fold, making them seem like a credible team to win back their titles that they have only lost a few weeks ago. Next up, we have a Hall of Fame induction package for Rick Rude. Pretty self-explanatory, really. Most of the Hall of Fame packages are pretty samey. Shows them in the best possible light. Obviously, Rick Rude was very good in his day. Um, his character was brilliant. His in-ring work was very good as well. Just showed him a few shots of winning a few championships and interspersed with the usual sort of praising from various members of the current roster. We then cut to a backstage with Mick Foley explaining that Enzo and Cass will be facing the bar the following week 
and the winner of that match will go on to face the club at WrestleMania for the tag team titles. Now, I can only presume that that ends up in another schmoz finish because we then get booked the triple threat tag team match for the titles at WrestleMania um, that were actually won by the Hardys when they make a surprise return. So I can only assume that the club get involved and that ends up in a no contest as well. Making sure to push absolutely nobody. At this point, Stephanie McMahon comes in and is berating Mick and tells him to come into her office, basically emasculating him as she is one to do. Now to Kurt Angle, but very much so back to Mick Foley back in the day. We have a second cruiserweight match, Akira Tozawa versus Arya Divari. Villa, really. So pointless. There's mentionings of the Brian Kendrick and his feud with Akira Tozawa because he's trying to teach him various different lessons in kind of a show me respect because I'm a veteran kind of storyline that was alright but just didn't really lead to anything at all. Tozawa handily beats Davari and Kendrick comes out and says well I'm not going to do anything now but You'll find out what the next lesson is on 205 Live tomorrow. Basically a really shallow way of trying to get the crowd invested in watching 205 Live on the network the next day. But they weren't really bothered and neither was I watching it back, to be honest. Then we have a tag team match between the New Day, who at this point already knew that they were going to be the hosts of WrestleMania. And it was still speculated that they were going to somehow be involved in the tag team match. Obviously they weren't. And they are facing the Shining Stars. Who I believe are still members of the roster. They're just injured. It was really weird seeing them on TV. Anyway, they come out with an ice cream tricycle thing. Because at that point they were trying to get New Day ice cream sold I suppose. Now we've moved on to pancakes. It was completely pointless. The Shining Stars had a bit of an early advantage. Big E comes in and completely annihilates them and they win. So that's two pointless matches in a row. Great. Then to celebrate Women's History Month, we have a package dedicated to the rivalry between Trish and Lita. Now, obviously, at this point, we hadn't had the Mae Young Classic. We hadn't had the first ever Women's Money in the Bank ladder match. We hadn't had the Royal Rumble, we hadn't had the Elimination Chamber, there was no sign of Ronda Rousey, there was no mentionings of Asuka's streak because obviously she was still in NXT. So all there had been in terms of notable women's matches and storylines in recent years were obviously the four horsewomen coming up, but by this point they'd kind of been flattened out to some degree. Apart from maybe a few decent matches between Sasha and Charlotte the previous year, culminating in their Hell in a Cell match at Hell in a Cell, and that being the main event of the pay-per-view. But if memory serves, the match itself was okay, it felt like they were kind of making it the main event because they thought they probably should. So this Lita and Trish package was pretty much just around the fact that one time they main evented Raw for the women's title. Great. Thankfully, women's wrestling has gone on a hell of a lot since then. Because if we were celebrating this now, that's quite pathetic. But there we go. This leads into a segment surrounding the women's title. Mick Foley calls out Bailey, the champion. And at this point, we get a quick recap of Sasha Banks coming out at Fastlane and, unbeknownst to Bailey, helping her to retain her title and beating Charlotte's pay per view streak. And Bailey has now obviously looked back at this and kind of feels a bit empty for the win. It kind of feels like she didn't deserve it. Almost like it should have built towards her maybe vacating the title, feeling like she didn't really deserve it. Or putting the title on the line right there and then against Charlotte and saying, look, we should have a proper match for this. I'm a fighting champion. I want to be a fighting champion. Let's have that match right here, right now. Everyone is banned from ringside. 
Don't bring Dana Brooke. I won't have Sasha Banks out here either. But we didn't get that at all. Instead, Sasha came out and kind of tried to pander to Bailey and say, look, you, you're the champion. You you win by any means necessary, which is so not Bailey's character at all. And she still hasn't recovered from this. This is sort of the beginning of her downfall, basically. This leads into a pretty lacklustre four-way match at WrestleMania, which then leads into her feud with Alexa Bliss, and we all know how that ended up. Anyway, as I said, Sasha Banks comes out and throws her hat into the ring to be the next challenger. This prompts Charlotte to come out and basically say, look, we can see through your plan, Sasha. Your idea was to keep the belt on Bailey because you know you can't beat me. So you keep the title on Bailey because you know you can beat her for it at WrestleMania. That's not happening. At this point, Stephanie McMahon comes out to huge CM Punk chants, which she completely ignores and attempts to sort of bulldoze them by just plowing through regardless, but they do not let up at all. She does at one point say, yeah, that's typical of you crowd cheering for the wrong person, obviously suggesting that they should be cheering for Charlotte because she should be the deserving champion and not Bailey, even though they weren't really cheering for Bailey anyway because the crowd had kind of soured on her by then because she just wasn't really doing much. And Steph makes a match for Wrestlemania it will be Bailey versus Charlotte. Charlotte should by rights be the champion so she will get that opportunity again at Wrestlemania. This is where Mick Foley grows some balls and basically says you cannot count out Sasha Banks. She has done so much over the last six months she deserves her opportunity at Wrestlemania as well. And Foley suggests that there should be a match next week between Charlotte and Sasha and the winner will face Bailey. And Steph basically puts the kibosh on that and says, no, 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 Charlotte's going to WrestleMania. But Sasha could get to WrestleMania if she beats Bailey in the match next. So that's what then plays out. It's a pretty decent TV match between the two of them. Certainly not one of their classics, but obviously it's, it's not a pay-per-view, it's not a title match, so but it's fairly decent throughout and quite even. Charlotte is on commentary with Dana Brooke and obviously Corey is bigging Charlotte up and basically saying that Bailey won using underhand means and that Sasha's going to turn on Bailey as soon as she can. It's so transparent what her motivation is and here we are a year later and we still haven't seen the culmination in their tensions. Oh, that would have been so good about six months ago, but we're still waiting for it. Anyway, Charlotte on commentary was a bit horrible, to be honest. She just doesn't sound very natural at all. They tried to set her up for a few things, and some of it was coming off okay, but the, the problem with it as well was you had then people like Michael Cole interrupting her, and she's trying to get into her rhythm. So it then got to a point where she just wasn't saying anything unless she was being directly addressed or asked questions. And it got quite awkward to listen to, to be honest. Anyway, by this point, Charlotte has sort of had enough and goes to a ringside. It's still fairly even. Sasha's starting to get the upper hand and has Bailey in the bank statement. Bailey is clawing her way to the ropes to try and force a rope break to get out of the hold. Charlotte gets up on the apron to either, I don't know, try and hit Sasha Banks in order to call the match off. Sasha uses this opportunity to sort of push against Charlotte and the ropes to roll Bailey back into the center of the ring to lock in the bank statement even more and make her tap for the victory. So Sasha Banks is going to WrestleMania as well and we're gonna get a triple threat match. So, a month out from WrestleMania, your champion, Bailey has beaten Charlotte and ended her streak in the lamest possible way, thanks to interference from Sasha, who then beats the champion the night after to guarantee a title match of her own, thanks to the other person who will also be in that match in Charlotte. Way to make Bailey look strong. So you've got two champions now. You've got Bailey and the club as the tag champions. That look weak as hell. Cool. 
It's time for another video package. This one is revolving around Seth Rollins' knee injury that he suffered a few weeks ago thanks to Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe made his entrance after the Royal Rumble and there was a beatdown angle on Seth Rollins at the behest of Triple H. And in and amongst that, Rollins legitimately injured his knee. So you see a bit of his physio trying to strengthen the knee back up ready for WrestleMania. You also get the confrontation played out again between him and Triple H where he says, look, I might not be 100% medically cleared, but I promise you I will be at WrestleMania and you will face me. And Triple H sort of retorts with, well, if you come, it's going to be the last thing you do and this is your last warning. Because if the experts say that you're not ready and you come anyway, then mm, I'm not going to be responsible for you having your career ended because of me. So, ha 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 ha. The main event for this evening, in terms of match at least, is... Chris Jericho against Samoa Joe, just sort of tying off the angle from the beginning of the night. Now, early on, Samoa Joe, who, again, as we've just said, has only just come to the main roster, is made to look very, very strong in this match against Jericho. Obviously, as we know, Jericho is never one to shy away from trying to put the newer, hotter act over and doing his role brilliantly here taking an absolute lick in. Once he tries to fire himself back up, or the crowd try and fire him back up, and he gets back into this match, he throws the kitchen sink at Samoa Joe. And what's interesting is he finds it nigh on impossible to take Samoa Joe off of his feet. He's just absorbing all of this punishment again and again and again. Almost akin to what we kind of expect now from Braun Strowman, where everyone throws everything at him and he just absorbs it and then attacks back. This is what we get from Samoa Joe here. Eventually, the fight spills to the outside of the ring and Samoa Joe is able to kind of get back into things here. He uses the environment to his advantage and in a finish that's quite interesting actually and I don't understand why more people don't employ this as a legitimate finish because at the end of the day a win is a win he gets Jericho in the Kikina clutch outside the ring so obviously he can't tap out and at this point the referee has obviously started his 10 count Samoa Joe keeps this hold locked in takes Jericho down to the mat he's completely passed out at this point Samoa Joe waits until the count of eight, releases the hold and rolls into the ring on the count of nine. Pretty much then by the time he stands back up again, the referee counts to ten and Jericho has been counted out. It's a pretty logical, sensible way of winning a match as far as I'm concerned. And I don't understand why we don't see it more often, especially from heel characters who, at the end of the day, don't really care how they win. I can understand faces maybe not doing it so much because they need to put up a valiant fight and win honourably, and it's not a very honourable way of winning, but it's within the rules of the match. It was just quite nice to see, to be honest. And it keeps Jericho relatively strong for his match at WrestleMania against Kevin Owens because he didn't lose via tap-out or pinfall. But at the end of the day, Jericho's not really going to get hurt by losing to the likes of Samoa Joe anyway. It's not really that much of a problem. It was just quite a nice ending to the match, to be honest. Samoa Joe then goes back outside to bring Jericho back into the ring to deal more damage to him. And Jericho surprises him with the code breaker and makes good his escape. So you get a bit of heat back on Chris Jericho. He, as the wily veteran, manages to outsmart Samoa Joe in the end. But Samoa Joe still made to look pretty strong through Jericho's actions in the match, not being able to sort of topple him. And ultimately, he won against the United States champion. So that's always a good thing. Then we have the main event segment, I suppose, of the night. A segment between Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns. Braun Strowman comes out first, and this is when he's starting to get his huge sort of babyface pops when you hear his 
Braun at his music entrance. He comes out and he says, look, I don't want a match against you, Roman. I just want to beat you up. I don't care about Fastlane and what happened then. Come out here right now and I will pummel you to bits. We're a little bit ahead of ourselves, but pretty much what he said was, come out here and get these hands. But obviously he didn't say that because he wasn't doing that then. Roman's music hits to a deafening chorus of boos. He walks very slowly to the ring, and as soon as he is in the ring ready to confront Braun Strowman, Undertaker's music hits, and he takes about five minutes, although it feels like about 50 minutes, to very slowly and theatrically walk to the ring. Yeah, we've seen it a million times. It would be nice if he kind of sped it up a bit on episodes of Raw. Granted, even then he hadn't been seen very often, and obviously at the moment if he makes an appearance in the next few weeks to have some kind of promo either with or sort of at John Cena, then yes, his first entrance in should be quite a nice, slow and methodical one. But we'd seen it a fair few times already that year from The Undertaker, so yeah, it would have been nice if it had kind of sped up a bit, to be honest, because we know what to expect. You can do the whole pomp and circumstance at pay-per-views. You don't need to do it every single week on Raw. Anyway, he finally makes it into the ring, at which point Braun Strowman goes, Nope, I don't want any part of this, and gets out. Roman then turns to The Undertaker and goes, well, What are you doing here? Braun called me out, not you. This is my yard now. And then he receives a choke slam. Two huge cheers from everyone. And that is where the episode ends. Now, I'm not sure at this point whether it had already been mentioned that... Roman and Taker were going to have a match at WrestleMania. Certainly the commentators didn't make mention of it, so this might have been the sort of start of that Roman sort of coming back out the next week and challenging The Undertaker in retaliation to that seemingly uncalled for attack. Not really sure. But annoyingly, this is sort of where the Braun Strowman experiment is kind of put on ice. He's shoved into the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal and doesn't even win it even though everyone knew that he should have done. So there we have it. That was the Raw after Fastlane 2017 and we built quite a few things I think towards Wrestlemania. There was the tension carried on between Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho that ultimately made a match for the United States title, which was very nice. We got to see Goldberg for the first time with the Universal title and his first exchange with Brock Lesnar. And Brock Lesnar managing to get one up on Goldberg for the first time. The tag team situation, although it was getting a bit messy, it was clear they were trying to sort of get all of the teams involved in a match presumably for a payday, hence the kind of endless schmozzy finishes so that no one was really getting the upper hand on anyone so that you could realistically and legitimately include everyone, which I kind of get, but it just flattened everything out, to be honest, so it was a good thing that the Hardys came back and were able to kind of dethrone everybody. Problem was, by then, it kind of killed any Enzo and Cass momentum because by then you felt, right, this has got to be the time where they win the titles. If they don't do it now, they're never going to do it. And funnily enough, they never did. And also, since then, the bar uh. have been a complete non-entity for the past year. They had a little bit of a spike in popularity when they were aligned with Finn Balor for all of about three weeks, but that seems to have ended, which is a shame. Please move all three of them over to SmackDown and start them again because they need it. We also had the beginnings of the WrestleMania match for the women's title taking shape, obviously leading straight from the events of Fastlane nicely towards WrestleMania. That did ultimately become a four-way match because Nia Jax ended up being added to it. Um, I'm not entirely sure how, I can't remember. I'm sure you can remind me in the comments whether she... I really hope she didn't beat Bailey for a 
opportunity in because if she did that's another nail in Bailey's coffin and no wonder the crowd kind of went cold on her and she still hasn't been the same since. We got a little bit of progression on the Seth Rollins situation just reminding us of him and Triple H's thing going forward which obviously led to his whole Kingslayer shtick that he did and a pretty kind of nothing match if we're being honest. We got the beginnings of the feud between Neville and Austin Aries that lasted for about three months until Austin Aries then left the company, which was a shame, but this was quite nice at the beginning and led to a very, very good match on the WrestleMania pre-show. Please don't put the Cruiserweight title match on the pre-show this year. Make it a ladder match because it's vacant as well. Ladder match. Please. And obviously we got the Roman Reigns Undertaker bit, I think starting the tensions between those two, leading to the Undertaker's retirement. So yes, all in all a pretty good Raw for getting us towards WrestleMania, as it should have been. As I said at the beginning of the video, the next video I will be doing, I will be looking at the Raw after WrestleMania 9, where Hulk Hogan managed to win the title, even though the match was between Bret Hart and Yokozuna. Cool. And The Undertaker managed to beat the giant Gonzalez because he got chloroformed. Yes, that WrestleMania. Woo. Raw was in its infancy at the time, so it'll be interesting to see how they proceeded. But until then, I have been that British guy, and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.